joining me right now to weigh in on this really an investigation, but no charges for Andrew Cuomo, governor of New York, is our good friend Andy McCarthy, bestselling author, contributing editor at National Review, and uh, also former chief assistant U.S. attorney. You can see him on Fox News as well. And we're going to get into the eviction moratorium. He's got some good pieces up about this, but and he has one forthcoming also on this whole Cuomo situation. But Andy, as always, appreciate your time with us today. I've got to get your reaction to this because they, you know, I was reading the report and they accuse him of unlawful action, but there's no no statement on any kind of charges. If it's a criminal action, where are the charges? That's right, Dana. Wait, I have to pry open my why do bad things happen to good people file <laughs> here. But, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's hard to feel sorry for this guy because he's such a low life, um, and that isn't exactly late breaking news. But at the same time, I, I have to say, as somebody who used to prosecute cases for a living and who was a, a litigator for a long time, you usually, if you're uh, planning to do something like bring a lawsuit or indict someone, you're kind of uh, curtailed. To the things that you can prove if it's a criminal case it's what you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt in court and if it's a civil case it's what you can prove by the preponderance of the evidence you often find all kinds of stuff um, that is disturbing but you know fits into the bucket of stuff i can't prove in court and that doesn't find its way into the four corners of official documents here i think it's very interesting particularly given that Letitia James is widely regarded, particularly in the in the New York media and the New York political environment, as someone who's likely to run for governor at some point, maybe as early as next year, particularly if that job happens to be open. Um, and, you know, you have this situation where she says our job is just to conduct an investigation and publish our findings. No limitation on what you might be able to prove in court, whether in the criminal context or the civil context. You know, if this was being applied to like a regular person as opposed to, uh, you know, a governor, um, you would have real due process problems with it. And even in connection with the governor, you know, if he was being impeached, you could say, well, impeachment's a, a political remedy. It's not a legal remedy. So you can understand why they would throw everything, including the kitchen sink in there. But that's not this isn't even that. Yeah, it's it's very uh, it's a it's odd. I mean, the whole thing. And I was I was I was reading it this morning. And I mean, they they get into you know pretty much all these accusations talking to our friend Andy McCarthy uh, about this, uh, the, the report that came from New York Attorney General Letitia James's office. And they even touch on how he was really using his authority in office to, to go after and, and, and penalize these women if they had uh, not really gone along with what he was suggesting. And then I've been seeing a number of things, too, Andy, where his brother at CNN had been writing draft statements for him. All these emails are coming out. I don't know if there's, you know, if, if he's going to get dragged into this. I, I, I guess my question is, where can they go with this other than, you know, just civil suits at this point, I think, if they're not going to bring charges against him? Well, the most obvious thing, I think, Dana, is this plotting impeachment investigation, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, I think is is set up in a way by Cuomo sympathizers. We'll, we'll see how sympathetic they remain, but they're Cuomo sympathizers in the assembly, and it's designed to fail because every time anybody makes like the slightest allegation against Cuomo, they say, oh, we have to include that in the investigation. And they've taken on so many things that, you know, this guy will be like in his sixth term by the time they decide what to do about it. So this may actually, you know, turbocharge that process because, you know, we always look at stuff through the prism of national politics mm -hmm. where the, where the uh, fault line is between the Democrats and the Republicans. And that's really not the way to look at New York. New York is, there's no, there's no Republican party to speak of in New York, like as a functioning, thriving party. Right. And the interesting political divide in New York is between woke progressives and mainstream Democrats. And what you have in the assembly are a lot of woke progressives who would like to get rid of Cuomo and have one of them 
like Letitia James uh, in his office. And then you have these kind of old line uh, Cuomo, Clinton, Schumer, mainstream Democrats who are trying to hold them off because they think that eventually um, the woke politics drives away moderate voters. And if there's any, I don't think the Republicans could ever revive themselves, but maybe the woke Democrats can revive them. But anyway, that's the interesting fault line. And I just think it's it's fascinating that she, that James is the one who pushed this report out when you know, Cuomo supposedly under investigation by the U.S. attorney in Brooklyn and for a while by the Justice Department. And there's this impeachment thing. And nobody's really laid a glove on him except the New York Post. Mm, right. Yeah. And then two times now she's crushed him. You know, she she came out with that report uh, months ago, which kind of triggered the uh, the impeachment investigation in the first place. And now she's really dropped the hammer on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noted in the because you have a piece coming out about this uh, and, and that's going to be publishing. Uh, and I you did make the point without obviously giving the whole thing away uh, that she they didn't really have any limitations as to what they were going to look at, what they weren't going to look right. at and, and as and what they could say publicly. So it does. And, and you also brought up just a, a couple of minutes ago talking with our friend Annie McCarthy that she's ha may have an interest in running for the governor's office. This is just scores a lot of points for her. This is multiple birds with one stone, and it really puts her in a good position on the back of at one point, which Democrats seem to view Andrew Cuomo as their golden boy, maybe going into 2024. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, if you think about his potential political, whether, he, whether he's been fatally damaged now, whatever his future prospects are, the, the things that hurt him, that crush him right now, are twofold. One is how the, uh, the patients at the nursing homes in New York were handled, especially his uh, executive order, which required the nursing homes to take COVID-positive patients. And now this very comprehensive report involving 11 victims of sexual harassment, and not just the lurid sexual harassment allegations, but how he turned the governor's office into a hostile environment, and most importantly, maybe under potential legal, uh, you know, jeopardy or threat, the retaliation by by his staff and and people in the uh, executive chamber in the New York government, um, which could be a big problem for him. Mm. So he's got those two things. They both come from Letitia James's office. She is the one who put out the report about his treatment of the COVID patients. And now she comes out with this today. Ooh, very interesting. And that's, yeah, and that's my, on this, before we talk about the, the uh, eviction moratorium, why is it, and I'm sure that there's perhaps a perfectly good legal explanation, but it just seems odd to me that there is more outrage, it seems, bipartisan outrage, at least, over this issue than there was over the, for the lack of a better way to put it, nursing home massacre. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I guess I've always thought that the nursing home thing, and I'm I'm hardly unique in this, mm. but that is much more consequential from a policy standpoint. Now, you know, I don't I don't mean to be uh, dismissive, and well, I'm course. not dismissive, but I would feel differently if the sexual harassment allegations were, you know, like rape mm. or you know something that was uh, clearly. Criminal, And there is one allegation here we should point out that's a groping allegation that actually appears to be being investigated as a criminal case uh, by the, by the Albany police. But, you know, this is not this is not the worst kind of sexual harassment that you can imagine. Right. Whereas the uh, the covid part of this, I mean, thousands of people died on account of that. Uh, the the number of you know they've they've tried to depress the statistics, but th there could be four or five thousand extra people who died because of that order, and then you know I I think a lot of people could have been sympathetic to Cuomo in the sense that at the beginning of the COVID problem we were all grappling and they certainly had a big problem in New York because they were worried about hospital space. They didn't know how bad it was going to get. You have to do something with people who were 
COVID positive. Um, so, you know, these are excruciating choices. I think people would have been sympathetic if the, he had just come clean and said, look, we screwed up. We shouldn't have put these people back in the nursing homes. But instead, what they not only did was cover it up. He then authors this self-congratulatory book about like, <laughs> look how great I handled this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I just I, this is why he's a loathsome character. Well, you know, Biden thinks that he's gold standard, though. Andy. I mean, you know, Biden said he, that he when he was doing his interview with John Carl and ABC, he was he had said that, well, I, you know, I, he, Andrew Cuomo, when he was asked about his response with coronavirus and a soundbite that's going to forever haunt him. He said that Andrew Cuomo was was gold standard, gold standard in handling that, which, of course, now, you know, uh, it, just that now that we have the facts and now that the story is played out. I wanted to, to quickly ask you as well before we go, uh, and we're talking with our friend Andy McCarthy, this eviction moratorium, I know that this is now this is lapsed and that Nancy Pelosi has asked the White House and she's also demanding that the Supreme Court get involved in this. And I, I was reading the proposal and I thought it was interesting that it really focuses on renters, but it doesn't talk, Andy, about property owners who have mortgages. It doesn't talk about people paying property tax. I, I, I mean, I have v- major issues with this, but from a legal standpoint, is this something that, that the Speaker of the House can just demand be done and the Supreme Court come in and weigh in on? No, Dana. And as a matter of fact, the news, as I heard it today, was that the Biden administration was pressing on state officials to try to do what they could do under state law to uh, to try to help these people. And I agree, by the way, you know, progressive ideology is that if you're a property owner, even a small property owner who's being ruined by somebody not paying rent, mm-hmm. you're an evil capitalist property right. owner. Right? I mean, that's the fable that, that we go by, right? right? But um, the fact that Biden is turning to the state officials should ring a bell for people that this is because this is something the national government should never have gotten into in the first place. The Constitution allows Congress to to regulate interstate commerce. Most lease arrangements between renters and owners are intrastate, and they're supposed to be state law matters. The federal government really doesn't have anything to say about it, and this is probably I would say it would, if we were just talking in originalist terms, this would be definitely unconstitutional. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court, the, its jurisprudence on the Commerce Clause pretty much allows the national government to do anything. So the issue here probably isn't so much the constitutional Commerce Clause question as it is the fact that what the CDC was acting under, it had no statutory authority. I mean, basically, it made up uh, – it distorted the the congressional statute under which it purported to authorize this thing. And what the Supreme Court was ready to find a month ago was that they had overstepped their authority, which about six other federal courts had already found. And the only reason the court didn't do that was because it only had about five weeks to go till it was about to lapse. So Kavanaugh, rather than voting with the four other conservatives, said, we don't want to lift the stay at this point when there's only five weeks to go. This will give them time to organize uh, their response and get the funding that's already been voted dispersed out. And of course, they didn't do anything for oh. five weeks. They dithered. And, you know, there's forty nine billion dollars or forty seven billion dollars in the pipeline. You know how much of it they've gotten out so far? I'm Three. A, yeah, I was going to say Three I'm afraid billion. to ask. <laughs> Three billion. So there's like 93 percent of the money that Congress appropriated for this. They haven't even gotten to the renters. And the reason the renters haven't applied for the money is why should they apply for the money? They don't they're not paying their rent. Right. Right. Oh, my goodness. It's it's it is an absolute mess. You have a great piece on it. People need to check it out. It's up at National Review, an eviction moratorium lesson from and for the Supreme Court. Our friend Andy McCarthy, always value your opinion and your time with us. Thank you so much. Good to talk with you, my friend. Thanks, Dana. Of course. Take care.